All right, as we continue our series here in the book of Romans, and you maybe noticed from your bulletin the title of the message, Red Herrings. You maybe are wondering about that, and it doesn't mean that there's something fishy about Romans. But this phrase is something that is used in everyday conversation. It's a term that we sometimes hear at least and maybe sometimes even use. A red herring is something that diverts attention away from the real issue, throws off the track. And I, as I understand it, the term came from when fugitives were fleeing from the law, from justice, and the law people had their bloodhounds and tracking the criminals that were escaping. And these criminals would have these red herrings that they would drag across the path to confuse the scent, to divert the track, to divert the issue. And as we have looked into the second chapter of Romans, we saw last time together that God was an utter realist, that God sees through all of the facade, all of the veneer of our lives. He penetrates down to where we really live, the real us. And all of these things that we have carefully hidden from other people, Samuel Johnson said, we know things about ourselves that we would not tell our dearest friends. And yet we begin to realize that God sees us in that kind of a way. We saw from the beginning chapter of Romans, uh, the second chapter of Romans, that God judges according to truth or reality. We saw that he judges according to deeds. And we also saw that he judges impartially. And the finishing verse of that first section, verse 16, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. And to realize that God knows us infinitely better than we know ourselves even it begins to make us uncomfortable, humanly speaking, that God would have that kind of knowledge, that kind of penetration of our facade of our lives. And uh, that may not be so bad, but when God begins to want to talk to us about these things, he wants to confront us about these hidden things, these secrets of men, the secrets of our hearts, we begin to get uncomfortable. And like Adam and Eve, as they, when they sinned, they disobeyed God. God called out in the garden. He said, where are you? And he discovered that they had made these, this clothing out of animal skins, that they had covered their nakedness to cover up, the first cover-up tactic ever pulled by man. And this has been going on ever since. And we begin to realize that God sees us in this total way, and God even wants to talk to us. He wants to confront us. And certainly the first half of Romans 2, we see God confronting man and his principles of judgment. And ultimately that day when we all will be evaluated. And the tendency, humanly, is to throw God off the trail, to drag one of these red herrings across our trail, to divert him, to get him off of our case. And this is a very natural reaction. Remember when Jesus talked to the woman at the well, as it's recorded in John 4, and he talked to her about living water. And she was very interested. She was very responsive. She wanted to know about this living water. And then our Lord, all of a sudden, took, took the focus and put it upon her. And he said, go call your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And he said, you've said that rightly because you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And uh, she very quickly changed the subject and changed it to perhaps the greatest red herring, the greatest diversionary tactic that man has devised. And she switched the subject to the subject of religion. She said, now you Jews worship God uh, in Jerusalem. This is the place to worship. And we Samaritans believe that uh, we should worship him here at Mount Gerizim. Now what's the place to worship? And she diverts it with the subject of religion. And here at the end of chapter 2 in Romans, we see man, we see the Jew, specifically from the first century, the one who has God's written word, taking the red herring and dragging it across the track, across the trail, 
to divert God from the real issue. Now, picking up the context a little bit more in Romans, we noticed originally that the theme of Romans was the righteousness of God, which is available on the basis of faith and faith alone. And man needing God's righteousness, and so the first chapters here, beginning in the middle of chapter 1, all the way through chapter 2 and on into chapter 3, the first half of chapter 3, showing man's need of salvation, showing that man, outside of a relationship of total dependence and trust upon the living God and his provision for perfect righteousness, is totally, hopelessly lost and outside the favor, the grace of God. We saw in chapter 1, the last half of chapter 1, the person without the written word of God, the pagan Gentile, and how he has a certain amount of light and yet he has not responded to that light but instead suppresses the truth and is therefore lost. We saw last week, or our last time together, the, in the, the Jew being described, I believe it's the Jew here in chapter 2, the first half, and certainly it is as we pick it up at verse 17, if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and so on, that it is, is the Jew here, the one with the written word of God, the one with direct divine revelation, and how he also is lost. And until we realize our lostness, then we cannot properly lay hold of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. So this is the what is going on here is to show now this other category of humanity, in the first century it was the Jew, who had God's written word, and he also was lost, uh, generally speaking, uh, as, of course, they took the knowledge and the light of God and did not respond to it properly either. Uh, as you look at verse 13 of chapter 2, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. What we have now in verses 17 to the end of the chapter is this that is mentioned in verse 13 <clears throat> so uh, distinctly uh, being elaborated on. He wants to nail down this whole thing of verse 13 further so that there's no room of escape in the mind of the Jew as he realizes his condition before God. Now, the Jew, of course, prized the, 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 the Bible, the Old Testament. It was his prized possession. And the, the knowledge and the advantage of the law was something that he esteemed very highly. Now, the problem was that he trusted in his having the law, in hearing the law, and not the appropriation of the law not the actual response of the law. If you'll turn your page over to chapter 3, verse 20, we see the purpose, the basic purpose of the law. And we see it stated in, in chapter 3, verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The Jew was not allowing the real work of God's word, the law, to have its full effect in his life. And that was to, to lead him to the point where he saw his sin and reached out by faith and claimed, appropriated God's gift, perfect gift of righteousness in Jesus Christ. Instead, they were trusting in the law, their creed, what they believed, the possession of the Bible, the knowledge and advantage of esteeming this very highly. And then, of course, the prescribed ritual that they had, which is in the end of the chapter, starting in verse 25. Circumcision. They were trusting in these things instead of in, in the living God. Now, first of all, in verses 17 through 24, we see red herring number one, a right kind of creed, is what they possessed. Verses 17 through 24. And as we read this together, we're going to see that, uh, of course, the Jew of his day was the world's greatest religionist. And we can substitute the title Christian here just as well. Let's not just keep this in the first century with the Jew. The way this applies right now, today, in the 20th century, is the word Christian instead of the word Jew. That we have a great body of truth that we delight in. We prize the possession of the Bible. 
We esteem very highly its knowledge and its advantage, but that in itself does not make us right with God. And there was the fatal mistake of the Jew, as he had this one thing that he felt surely God would accept him because he had the law and understood it was exposed to the knowledge of the law. And first of all, the claims of the Jews in verses 17 through 20. <clears throat> now, some of you may have a new international version, and I believe the, the way the new <clears throat> international version <clears throat> has set up this is the correct uh, meaning behind this. <clears throat> now, you'll notice in verse 17 it says, but if you bear the name Jew. Now, the new international version also carries this if all the way through the passage. But if you bear the name Jew, or we apply this today, if you bear the name Christian, and if you rely on the law and boast in God, in other words, the if re uh, applies to this whole sequence here. If you rely upon the law and boast in God, or rely on the Bible and boast in God, and know his will and approve the things that are essential or superior, being instructed out of the law, and if you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, and a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, this is the punchline now, if these things are true, therefore, this ought to be the result. You who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? And so on. So the hypothetical if, I believe, refers to the whole passage here, verses 17 through 20, and this is the claim that the Jew prized him, prided himself on, was that he did these things. Now, he was doing these things, but in a perverted way. He thought he was doing them just right, and certainly the way they're described here is, is the right way. And uh, we see the name Bear the Jew, or this member of this covenant people, relying on the law, that's God's written word, boasting or glorying in God. This is a good thing, even as the psalmist said, uh, I, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. It's the th that's the thing to do, is to boast or glory in God. Uh, to know his will, as the passage goes on. This is the revealed will of God. To approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law. This is a keen moral discernment of, because of exposure to the law. A guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness. This is spiritual insight. A light for them in darkness. He was confident that he could counsel, that he, could, he had the answer for other people. And uh, he was confident because he had in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So they were confident because they had this, and they were so sure that God would accept them because they had the law and the knowledge of the law. And this is very frightening. <clears throat> this shows the, the terrible perversity of human nature, that a person can really be out of it, and the nation as a whole was out of it spiritually, evidenced supremely by the fact that they crucified their Messiah when he appeared to them. But they thought that they, they had it. They thought that they were in the center of the will of God, and yet they were totally out of it, or greatly out of it. They were doing all of this that is described in verses 17 through 20 in a perverted way, all within the context of orthodox biblical religion. Now today, perhaps the greatest blinder of all is for us to have the Bible and call ourselves Christians and yet to be out of it, to really be missing the, the, the whole thrust as the Jews were in the first century as a whole. Where is our source of reliance? Where is our focus? It's either upon God primarily at the center or it's on something else, something, some external. And I think we need to very soberly look at this as ones who pride ourselves on the Bible. This is what we would call, generally speaking, a Bible church. We're here, uh, one of the main reasons we're here is to learn the Bible. And yet we could be in the same condition that this person, or these, this category of humanity who had the Bible in the first century were in. A.W. Tozer said this, Sound Bible exposition is an imperative must in the church of the living God. Without it, no church can be a New Testament church in any strict meaning of that term. But exposition may be carried on in such a way as to leave the hearers devoid of any true spiritual nourishment whatever. 
For it is not the mere words that nourish the soul, but God himself. Unless and until the hearers find God in personal experience, they are not the better for having heard the truth. The Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into him, that they may delight in his presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and center of their hearts. The modern scientist has lost God in the midst of the wonders of this world. We Christians are in real danger of losing God amid the wonder of his word. And so this was the fault of the Jew, the claim of having the Bible and yet not really responding to its essential meaning in bringing him into a living, vital relationship with the living God. And now we see the indictment of the Jews in verses 21 through 24. You therefore, and again this is the, the punchline here, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. And so what the apostle, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is doing at this point is knocking the props very neatly out from underneath these people who had God's written word, showing, exposing the hypocrisy of their position. The question is, what does the Bible do to you? What does God's written word, how is it affecting your life? That's the question. It's a wonderful thing to have the right creed. It's a wonderful thing to have the right beliefs. That's basic. But the right creed has got to result in the right kind of conduct. The right beliefs have got to result in the right kind of behavior if it's going to be valid. And so he's asking some very penetrating questions here, some very embarrassing questions. And the punchline again is, you therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? In other words, they weren't practicing what they preached. And he gives some specifics. You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? The Jew was notorious all over the Roman world for their shrewd business dealings, so shrewd that no one really trusted them. As far as adultery is concerned, Jesus called that generation a wicked and adulterous generation. As far as idols were concerned, they wouldn't think of bowing down before an idol, but they did profit in the trade, the trafficking that involved idol worship. Somehow they got in there as middlemen and made some money off of idolatry. And so these questions are coming in on them at this point. And then verses 23 and 24, the, we see that uh, they are dishonoring God. And we see in verse 24 a quotation now from the Old Testament, from Isaiah 52.5 or Ezekiel 30, 36.20 and following, that the name of God was being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of them. Uh, not only was this true in the first century, but now he quotes a scripture to nail it down. Wow to pull that right out of what they considered to be their authoritative, which was the authoritative word of God, and say, now look, this is what the, the word of God says about you. And so comes this devastating indictment of one who simply trusts in an outward creed some proper religious statement as an indication of their acceptability to God. Now, I don't think we need to go into a great deal of detail to know that this is this characterizes American Christianity to a great extent. In fact, Christianity all over the world, that the name of God is blasphemed because of the, maybe not the creed, maybe not the beliefs of those who profess Christ, profess to be Christians, but the conduct, the over-sharp business deals, the dishonesty, the adultery, the idolatry, certainly in the heart which manifests itself in all kinds of maybe subtle and more sophisticated and socially supposedly acceptable ways. And yet God has told us that if we do it in the heart, 
we have done the act. And so we, we see this characterizing so much of modern Christendom today. Some time ago I read about a couple of young men who were on the, a street corner in Glasgow, Scotland. And they were talking together and this man walked by, this older man, very dignified looking man walked by and one of the young men said to the other young man, he said, there's the founder of the Infidels Club here in Glasgow. And the young, the, the young man that uh, had heard this said, well, uh, no, you're mistaken. I know that man. He's an elder in our church. And so the first young man said yes, but the way he does business, the way he conducts his personal affairs has actually turned men away from God. And therefore, the fact that he's the founder of the Infidels Club here in Glasgow is certainly literally true. I remember hearing of a man that I'd known for some years and esteemed him, as far as I knew, a very fine Christian. And yet his neighbor, a man who had lived next door to him for some number of years, said, I wouldn't go across the street. I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste my time listening to that man teach the Bible. That man has the worst temper of anybody I've ever known. What an indictment. What a terrible indictment to put upon someone who professes the name of Jesus Christ. Mr. Chad Walsh, in his book entitled Early Christians of the 21st Century, I think reflects this so wonderfully and truthfully. And this is what he says. Millions of Christians live in a sentimental haze of vague piety with soft organ music trembling in a lovely light from stained glass windows. Their religion is a pleasant, emotional thing, divorced from the intellect and demanding little except lip service to a few harmless platitudes. I suspect that Satan has called off the attempts to convert people to agnosticism. If a man travels far enough away from Christianity, he is always in danger of seeing it in perspective and deciding it is true. It's much safer from Satan's standpoint to vaccinate a man with a mild case of Christianity so as to protect him from the real thing. Now this is what these people here in Romans 2 had. They had a mild case of biblical religion so as to protect them from the real thing. And in the 20th century we see Christendom with this same problem to a very heavy extent. By the way, we think of statistics that are coming out now. One out of every three people in the United States today claims to be a, not just a Christian, but a born-again Christian. This is the popular thing now, to be a born-again Christian. One out of every three. And yet we see morality going down and down and down. The whole structure, the whole fabric of our society falling apart. And yet all kinds of people saying, yes, I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus Christ and all of the right words, all of the right creed. So this red herring of hanging this right creed before God and saying, you must accept me, I must be acceptable on the basis of my right creed, is not acceptable. Secondly, we see in verses 25 through 29 another red herring that is dragged across the trail here to throw God off the track, to get him off of our case. And that is an outward ceremony, an outward rite. And in this particular case with the Jew, it was that of circumcision. This was a symbol of an outward, this was an outward symbol of what had to be, if it was valid, an inward experience, a heart relationship with God. And of course, it was a symbol that they were in covenant relationship with God, that they were God's people. And we don't have to think very much today to substitute some other things in there for modern Christianity. We could substitute baptism or the Lord's Supper or church membership or confirmation. But I think supremely we can sub substitute the word baptism here, the ceremony, the rite of baptism. They parallel each other very much, circumcision and baptism, uh, <clears throat> although they don't parallel each other totally. There is a great deal of parallel between circumcision and baptism. But I don't know how many times I've asked a person in so many words, if not these exact words, are you a Christian? 
And they have come back and said, well, of course, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, baptized as a Catholic, or I was baptized as a Baptist, or I was brought up in the Methodist Church. And somehow hanging that certificate of baptism, or even that church membership, before God and saying, certainly you must accept this. I just never cease to be shocked. Even people that attend this church will make some, some kind of a statement that will reveal that they're trusting in some kind of outward ceremony instead of God's provision at the cross of Jesus Christ on the basis of grace through faith. Amazing. Amazing how a person can hear the Word of God over and over again and yet come through with the most ignorant, the most undiscerning statements which reveal their lack of understanding of a living relationship with God. And so the, what we see here in verses 25 and following as we read verse 25, for indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law. Or we might say baptism or church membership is of value if you practice the Bible. But if you are a transgressor of the law, God's written word, your circumcision or this right that you've undergone has become uncircumcision. It's useless. It's worthless unless we have a heart relationship with God, unless there is this response from the heart to him and his truth. And so circumcision was invalidated if from the heart men were not responding to God. On the other hand, verse 26, if therefore the uncircumcised man keep the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And we see that uh, if the person has the inward reality without having the external symbol, the inward reality of experience is that which God counts. Now, God wants the outward symbol. He's commanded it to the Jew, the circumcision, to the Christian, baptism, so on. But uh, if from the heart, if the thing is, if the experience is in the heart, then certainly God counts that, even though there may not be the outward symbol that the person has undergone. In verse 27, and will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, Will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? And then he goes on in verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew that is one of God's own people who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men but from God. God says, yes, undergo these outward ordinances, these outward rites, if I've commanded them. But make sure, make sure that, you're, that they are expressing, they are outward symbols of an inward experience, an inward reality. And when someone stands in the baptismal waters, they are simply dramatizing, they're simply picturing what has already happened in their heart. That is, if their baptism is valid. They're dramatizing that here is the old person. Here's the old person outside of Jesus Christ who is living with himself enthroned. And as they are lowered down into the baptismal waters, they are dramatizing that they have died with Jesus Christ. They've been buried with him. They have been raised up in newness of life. They're now sharing in the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. They're undergoing this because God has commanded it but it has no significance whatsoever unless the inward reality of death, burial, and resurrection with Christ has already been experienced. And we find that be the same with the Lord's Supper, partaking of the, the bread, the fruit of the vine. Only if we have seen ourselves in the perspective of his shed blood and his broken body only when we've seen ourselves as helpless and hopeless and lost sinners and that somebody had to die in our place, somebody had to be substituted on our behalf and bear the penalty of our sin before we could ever hope to approach an infinitely holy and just God. Before we could ever be acceptable, that penalty had to be paid 
and we could not pay it ourselves, someone else who was qualified had to pay it. The one who was God and yet man. The one who was sinless, paying the price of our own sin. And unless we have by faith Embrace this one who has been substituted on our behalf, then the partaking of the communion is totally worthless, totally meaningless, and in fact doing more harm than good because you may be using this technique of the red herrings and somehow using it to divert the control of the living God over your lives, letting him have the rightful place in your life and somehow substituting these rituals these ceremonies, these ordinances for letting him be at the very center of your life and heart as Lord and Savior. And of course, as we continue to think of the communion, as we partake not only that initial entrusting of ourselves to Christ as Savior and Lord, but the need continually to, to have the, the benefits of his death in our daily lives. And so these things, again, are outward symbols of an inward reality. And Paul's conclusion of chapter 2 of Romans is that man without Christ is hopelessly lost. Now this man knew what he was talking about. This is the man who said in Philippians, the third chapter, as I simply read this to you. You listen very carefully. He said, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the, circ the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, that is what I can produce humanly, is confidence in the flesh. And then he lists off these things that he, he was. He was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, the persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which was in the law, blameless, as far as his outward perfunctioning uh, uh, functioning and uh, following through on the outward external demands of the law. But then he said, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but refuse that I may win Christ. Not having a righteousness of my own, which is through the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God which is by faith. This man had his life in perspective. This man had it in focus. The law, God's written word was there, these rituals, these ceremonies were there, but his focus was upon the living God. That was his source of reliance. That was his focus. And we find that unless our focus is the same, where we have abandoned our lives and can say with Paul, I count all things but loss for the surpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, that whatever we have, whatever we call it, is not New Testament Christianity, is not biblical response to the living God. And what he wants us to do is to have Jesus Christ at the very center of our lives. He, and what he accomplished as our source of reliance, he being our focus, and us experiencing not Bible knowledge, not rites and ceremonies and trusting in them, but experiencing God himself, the living God. And may we feed upon him as we continue this service now, as we have a chance through these symbols to have our hearts satisfied, the hunger, the thirst of our hearts satisfied as we feed upon him.